in June this year, I was commissioned by the RNCN New Ensemble to write a six-minute piece for large ensemble. Whereas in previous practice, I have attempted to write music that is a ruin, a tenuous analogy at best, I here wanted to explore phenomenological affinities between the two. How could I equate my own ruined experience with the compositional process itself and relay this to a listener so they might empathise with this experience? Since childhood, I've been fascinated with ruins, not only following Brian Dillon as bleak but alluring reminders of our vulnerable place in time and, pl and space, but following scholars Tim Edensor and Caitlin De Silvi as spaces for reflection and play. When I first encountered the music of Helmut Lackermann, whose other was compared to my then teacher, to visiting the ruins of musical history, I was excited by the prospect of marrying these two disparate interests. My practice and research as a composer involved creating musical ruins, the quotation and fragmentation of existing music that might elicit a feeling in the listener analogous to that experience when visiting an architectural ruin. To begin the commission, I visited Radcliffe Tower in Bury, Greater Manchester, with dictaphone in hand, verbalising reflections as they came to me. These ranged from physical descriptions to existential ponderings on the affect of matter. I was occupied by the varying strata of brickwork and mortar, details of conservation and exposed cavity. Each face of the tower provided a kaleidoscopic terrain to be navigated visually and haptically. The more I scrutinised, the more lost I became in this lichen landscape, no longer a structure of human brick, but a lump of disarranged matter, a gestalt unravelling. Each piece of stone assumed its own identity, trajectory and story. Some loomed outwards and others receded. Suddenly I was by accost accosted by the sound of bells, the tickling of wind chimes, the thud of the church at noon, mocking the silent structure. I could see the tower as whole again, but the propensities of pushing and pulling matter intensified. I became fixed, physically or emotionally, within these simultaneously repelling and attracting forces. I then remembered reading about a twin tower now missing. I reasoned that such a tower must have continued along a similar trajectory as its sibling, but at a faster rate, its materials now torn and twisted from existence. This impressionable experience seemed to exhibit the vitality of matter proposed by new materialists within the past decade. Theorists such as Jane Bennett suggest a scenario where non-human en entities assume their own propensities, trajectories, and agencies, aside from, but often entangled with, that of the human. After vividly experiencing such a phenomenon, and as a composer who almost exclusively works with and is receptive toward the tendencies of existing musical material, I wanted to work with these ideas from a musical perspective. I selected extracts from the dictaphone recordings and redirected them towards my borrowing and orchestration of an existing music. These recorded extracts accompany the music in performance as a hint towards my word and method. By sharing first-person accounts and creating a narrative, I hope to invite a sympathetic response from a listener, what Susanna Keane describes in creative writing as narrative empathy. As with any novelist, I do not pretend to exert complete control over a listener's response, but instead invite a recognition of prior, and more importantly, current experience. The first step was to choose a piece of music, a material, to work with. After much surveying, I selected the motet by a 14th century French composer, Philippe de Vitry. This suited, as it was a near contemporary with the construction of the tower, and following the early music borrowings of composer Nicholas Collins, due to its generic quality, not only does it sound typically archaic, but includes few melodic motifs and is instead distinguished by a tightly knit polyphonic texture. In borrowing the entire motet as a macroscopic musical object, I hoped, after David Metzler's analysis of Luciano Berio's rendering, to deepen the illusion of disintegration. Metzer claims that, quote, we see or hear what seems to be an entire, possibly even familiar, work having succumbed to age, its expansive surface, scarred and faded, its bulk breaking apart into shards, end quote. I was interested in the Dimitri Motet as a scored and sonic object. In other words, a tangible material surface as well as a virtual, not quite body. I wanted to expose myself to the emerging opportunities from working with the motet as aged shards, as a malleable heritage object, 
an unfixed cultural artefact. The next stage, and what ended up forming the first section of the piece, was achieved by sight reading the first half of the motet at the piano, whilst quasi improvising with the rhythms and voice leading. The act of sight reading not only recalled my inquisitive exploration of the tower, but also began to probe how the musical materials worked on me as a maker. My capacity to move through the free voices was not only hampered by my ability to sight read multiple staves, but also by a suggested inclination to linger on this harmonic suspension or that moment of cadential arrival. I then transcribed this sight reading and began orchestrating it for the full ensemble according to my physical descriptions of the ruin. The instruments move between states of quiet and unstable tones, and barely perceivable sounds and high microtonal double mix create dissonant beating. The difference is perhaps nuanced, but such approaches towards orchestration were meant not as represent representation of the tower, but as a means of reflecting upon my observations, a creative autoethnography. And I'd just like to play a short extract from this first section. My bleak observation of the tower as a lump of material, a block, a squat, and inanimate, motivated me to now treat the musical materials in a very different way. Just as the material is momentarily freed from its stifling tumbral constraints, the De Vitri motet appears to puncture the taut musical surface, and then we abruptly return though something has changed. Established doubling relations suddenly evaporate, and each player is assigned a fragment from the motet, which they independently loop and accelerate. Each fragment is typical of the motet as a whole, but through the process of boxing off and repeating, they gain their own thing-like quality. Lawrence Kramer uses this term to describe musical entities that are open-ended, semi-animate, and intimate. The fragments are self-contained and go nowhere, yet suggest they might go anywhere, or their own particular somewhere. In freeing each fragment to repeat and combine in various ways over a given time period, the result is a densely knit texture that is at the same time malleable, fragile, and may, following Kramer, refer to a gathering. I wanted to create a situation where the materials themselves find their own way to sit. Kramer's expression, a house full of things, resonates with me here relinquishing a deep degree of control over the compositional materials, I ask if, and even Dimitri, I ask if I, and even Dimitri, still feel at home here, and which entities draw me in or defamiliarize me with the motet. And when we stand back again, we see a lot of material. It's just a block, and it's squat. Yeah. Suddenly, I was accosted by the sound of bells, the tickling of wind chimes, the thud of the church at noon. At various intervals, the entry of live bells intercede and suppress the looping and fragmented texture. What has consisted up to this point of high and fragile sounds begins to transform through more stable sonorities and instruments dropping out, eventually left with low double bass and harp. This moment seems significant to me within the piece. The live sounds of the bells, referring directly to the day at the tower, break the fourth wall and alter the level of musical representation previously established. 
the neighbouring gardens and nearby church are suddenly transplanted into the concert hall, or are the audience dropped amidst hedgerows and headstones and shatter the nuanced reflective distance? The invitation for empathetic response is extended, perhaps forcefully, much further. For the final section of the piece, I wanted to revisit my orchestration of the motet, whilst drawing upon the sensation of being pulled and repelled by matter, in this instance, musical. I began by examining existing music that has had this effect on me as a listener, and turned towards Bryn Harrison's repetitions in extended time, and what Salvatore Chirino refers to as marmalade sounds in his Efebo Hum Radio. Both feature frenetic activity, which is quiet, swelling dynamics, trills and glissandi. When directing these attributes towards my original orchestration of the motet, I began to feel led as a composer. Sliding string harmonics, winds in retrograde, and violently swelling harp and vibraphone both cycling through chromatic and modal gamuts. The two modes of orchestration did not sit well together, and I felt often forced decisions regarding the placement of register, movement through the overtone series, and the clashing of voices. At times I wonder if I overemphasize this lack of control, but I'm reminded of the frequent failed attempts to make revisions to the material generated by this process. The Da Vici motet, still proving its elasticity as a sonic object, is needed for the third time, constructed as a whole, pulled apart, and then reassembled in a far less stable state. ends with a short coda, a rumination on the absent twin <clears throat> tower. I begin to speculate that to look upon the existing edifice is to simultaneously look out from the missing monolith, to mentally construct from a state of negative. The coda it consists of a simple, traditional even, orchestration of the last phrase of the motet. I enjoy the possibility that in listening to these last bars, we concurrently hold in our mind's ear both the preceding permutations of the motet, as well as another imagined music, and not quite Dimitri, but encompasses and holds the material in place. I set out to communicate a personal extra musical experience through the manipulation of a musical object. In a sense, I have written program music. However, due to the focus on materiality, there is a shift towards objectivism music about music. Oh, formatting is not quite uh, done justice there. As the piece ponders the tendencies of the Dimitri Motet as a musical thing in accordance with a narrative situation, I wonder if it straddles the genres of program and absolute music equally. Whether I have succeeded in this piece or opened up avenues for further investigation, I want to tell the silent stories of musical matter, inert and dancing, alive and lamenting, I want to listen to the singing of not quite bodies. Thank you very much. <laughs> 